today I'd like to, uh, uh, is, our people were very spiritual, so as we begin this conference, and I'll, I'll speak more to this, but I'd like to have uh, my wife sing a, an acknowledgement song of our the Creator, who we should put first, and literally that is the song that she will sing, putting the Creator first. Thank you. Yeah, this is my sidekick. She's uh, just retired this year. Uh, she's a Montessorian uh, in all the levels, 03366912, if you know what that means. Uh, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, I want to say, you know, I, I take um, uh, great pleasure in uh, behalf of the Education Equity Conference and welcome you here because, and it says you're going to develop leaders, and I, that I do hope you do. And I, I just want to, um, I was going to have Betty sing an encouragement song because this is really uh, what this is all about. For me personally, uh, me being an American Indian, and uh, looking at the data, which puts us at the at the very bottom of this educational experience in America. Just look at the data. Uh, we're at the bottom, and so it should be that we look at how do we fix that. And that's you guys here. I really hope that uh, um, that we can make a change, make America understand, and you guys are leading it. Make understanding of that we, it's more important to create a, a good human being. We need good human beings walking around, uh, knowing how to treat one another, how to be good to one another, uh, how to work in a, in a place, in harmony, peace and harmony. That's what it's all about. Uh, we have a pipe, a peace pipe, and that's what that peace pipe was all about. It was about how to work. The bowl represented the universe, and when you, every time you brought it out, You'd always think of the universe and all that is, and it all should work together in harmony. So one of the things that we have is that you, you, you need this peace and harmony, and you've got to learn it someplace. And the schools teach academics. And that's okay, but I just, I just want to say that it's more important to create a good human being. And so you guys are working in education equity. And that is, I just want to commend you guys for the work because I think you guys all represent that. I, I, I sit back there at the table with James and he's with, he does project-based learning. And I did, a, a, our school did that. We did project-based learning for five years before it ended. <laughs> and we did uh, Montessori up to the fifth grade and then sixth, seventh, eighth with project-based learning. And we got Peter back there. He runs a school that's, uh, they do project-based learning from all day long. Instead of that regimented box that K-12 does, and I'm sure if you guys are operating those programs, uh, do it to it, 
create these great human beings. So you're going to see a lot of things today that are inspirational and uh, will help you in those uh, environments that you work. So I want to thank uh, Alex and Danica, Marcus, and Arwa. Where would she be? I don't see her. But anyway, that's the conference putting this thing together. I want to commend them and uh, I want to thank you uh, for the work that you're doing. Ha, homie talk, Cassie. Thank you, Elder Dave and Betty Archambault, for opening up the room. We will continue our opening with a performance by the Somali Dance Troupe. This talented group of Somali-American youth comes together to explore dances from various regions of Somalia, embracing and celebrating their cultural heritage. The Dance Troupe, a program of the Somali Museum, is dedicated to delving deeply into their roots through dance. Please welcome to the stage the Somali Dance Troupe.
Bahsan carar Barwah qada qahalaya Kupa ista Barta mahada wagi Baryaba Oh, 
Somali dance troupe. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> if you'd like to know more about them, they'll be doing a breakout session on their work and Somali history and culture here in this ballroom after the plenary. For those of you just tuning in, welcome. We have a fantastic opening plenary planned for along with an incredible lineup of speakers and breakout sessions. As we dive in, we want to take a moment to set the tone and get everyone energized for today. And to do that, please welcome Jackie Statham, Alan from the Bush Foundation, and Alex Vitrella from Education Evolving. Muchísimas gracias a nuestros estudiantes y a todos ustedes que están aquí con nosotros hoy. Thank you all for being here today. We are so thrilled to have the opportunity to spend a day together in community. And thank you to the Bush Foundation for believing in and investing in this movement for student-centered learning for equity. Thank you, Alex. The Bush Foundation is proud to support student-centered learning for equity and this movement. When we first hosted a convening in 2017, we never imagined it would blossom into what it is today. But really, we are seeing schools and organizations taking lead here and seeing what student-centered learning can mean for their communities and their students. Every year, the movement gets bigger and better and brighter, and that's because of all of you. A few years ago, we handed over the reins to Education Evolving to take over the planning of this event. And we have loved what they've done with this event, which is now theirs. Actually, I think this event has really been all of yours because education evolving since day one has been very intentional in making sure that this is your movement. Thank you, Jackie. If I may, SCL4E is also as special as it is because it has your leadership at the center and also the leadership of a group of advisors who span geographies, generations, contexts, and capacities, but are united in a shared belief of what we can accomplish together. Can I ask members of the SAL for E Advisory Council to please stand so we can celebrate you? Brilliant educators and change makers are responsible for so many of the things that you will experience and see today. Thank you. SEL4E and the movement surrounding it is growing. In years past, we have sold out in person tickets, but typically that's after several weeks of marketing and outreach. But this year, we ran out of in person space in a matter of days. And we don't want to celebrate that we had to open a waiting list and that not everyone who wanted to be here in the room with us was able to, but we do see this as a testament to how people are feeling about this event. Um, it's important. This is a place where we are able to engage and encourage one another and be equipped and be sustained and nourished, and I think most of all, feel connected to one, on one another in this movement. 
And we hope that all of you here in this room and everybody who is joining us online, that you feel valued and welcomed because you are. Unfortunately, sometimes that feeling can be hard to come by elsewhere. When school board members and other elected officials fail to see our humanity and acknowledge that of the students they're elected to serve. But fortunately, thanks to so many of you in this room and those of you joining us virtually, wonderful things are happening close to home. Just this past year, social study standards were approved here in Minnesota that embed ethnic studies and indigenous history throughout. <laughs> Also, a group, there's a new cohort of 50 educators from around the state who are part of a new heritage language program to license those teachers to bring back and reclaim languages and cultures that had previously been ignored in schools. Here is an activation space. We are here to learn from one another's successes and struggles because Student Center Learning for Equity is a movement, not just a moment. And when we nurture that movement, it expands and grows until we reach all students. Today's theme is seeing learners and building leaders. And that means valuing the assets and identities of our students. It means that the schools and communities that one day they will transform, right now we need to have their backs. There's wisdom that comes with age and there is wisdom in youth. The brilliance of, un um, I'm sorry, there's also brilliance in youth. A brilliance undimmed by the clouds of time. Our theme declares to students that we adults, we see you. And it charges us to help students to get to all the places that they are striving to lead. Now, it is my honor to welcome five incredibly brilliant leaders from across our region. Their commitment to student-centered learning for equity is evident in the impact they have on the youth they guide. We've invited them here to share with you how they, as leaders, see learners and then empower those learners to become leaders themselves. We trust that you all will see glimpses of your work in theirs because every single one of you here today is both a learner and a leader. So as they join us on the stage, I would like to share a little bit about each one of them. Sarah White is a natural leader and network weaver. She is the founder and executive director of the South Dakota Equity Education Coalition. Sarah is a passionate advocate for education, for indigenous education and student access. <laughs> Deka Muhudin is an incredible teacher and advocate who founded Minneapolis District Somali Heritage Language Program and was instrumental in the passage of the legislation that made way for those 50 new educators. Her official title is District Program Facilitator, Somali Heritage Language and Culture Program. Now, Dr. Corey Steiner is a bold leader in his community and across the region, always speaking up for centering students and sharing what his team co-designed in Northern Cass School District in North Dakota, where he serves as superintendent. Natalia Benjamin is the 2021 Minnesota Teacher of the Year. She, yeah. She collaborated with, with the first group of educators that brought ethnic studies to Rochester, Minnesota, and is part of the ethnic studies coalition that was instrumental in extending ethnic studies across the state. 
She is currently the Director of Multilingual Learning at Rochester Public Schools. And finally, last but definitely not least, Giovanni Ford has been with SEL for E since the very beginning, setting the tone and pushing this event to embrace the community and movement it gathers. Giovanni is a gifted leader and facilitator who gracefully uplifts the voices of youth in everything that he does. He is the founder and executive director of the Network for the Development of Children of African Descent. It's so good to see you. My name is Sarah White, and I am from the homelands of the Ocheti Shakoin um, in present day Rapid City, South Dakota. I grew up in a community called Rocky Ford in the heart of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and I'm joined by amazing um, fellow youth from our community here today who you'll hear more in depth from. I also want to give a shout out to um, Tui and Lekshi over there um, because it's because of predecessors like them that who forged the way for us that we're here today, standing on their shoulders to share work that will eventually um, our youth will take on. So unlike you all who the amazing um, the amazing work that you all are reaping the benefits for here in Minnesota. In South Dakota, we're striving for education equity and the pursuit for education equity for our indigenous youth is even more critical. In my role, my, my first and foremost priority is to elevate the voices of the most absent narrative of the fabric of America's ed system and that's our children. And so here um, in our work, we create opportunities that share space, hold space, and create space for our youth to tell the state elected officials what they need, what they demand, and what's going to create a more prosperous South Dakota for all South Dakotans. And we just with that, um, indigenous history is American history. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Deca, and I work for Minneapolis Public Schools, as it was mentioned earlier. And as I speak to you in terms of the prompts that were given to us, I remember when I first started teaching. And I had just graduated from the U of M, and I was like, OK, we're going to center our students. We're going to pick out books that represent their cultures. And we are going to read stories that inspire them. And as I thought about my students, and I worked with our students that were long-term language learners, um, obviously, initially, I was disheartened because I was like, this kid was born in the United States. I'm teaching 10th grade ESL, and they're still in my class, and we're struggling with academic writing. And so we, I had to think outside the box. Um, we had to bribe them with foods and different things, but we read stories, and we even put Columbus on trial. And that unit, I remember thinking to myself, what would this look like, and how would this inspire my students? And as we talked about indigenous um, populations and how the land was not founded by Columbus and how we had to put them on trial, I learned very fast that um, that empowered my students, it inspired them, and it gave them the authority to, um, to make decisions. I remember one boy f coming up to me and saying, Miss Decca, I cannot be defending this man, because I had <laughs> determined the groups. <laughs> and he was in that group, so I was like, you need, you need to think outside the box. But one... <laughs> But one thing that stood out to me was there was this student that would skip his classes and come to me. Um, and um, we would, I would initially just kick him out because I'm like, go back to your class. What are you doing in my class? Uh, but eventually we developed a bond and um, he became like an adoptee of my class. And the reason being it was because he saw um, his friends feel comfortable being able to play around and we just were a community of sorts. Um, inspired by that, I remember um, thinking, what can I do um, for my community? Because I've also been a part of, um, I taught at a Phelan Hmong magnet school, which I wouldn't be standing here today doing the job that I do, doing the work that I do, if the Hmong community have not set or paved the pathway for, for their heritage languages. Of course, there's the indigenous population, there's other populations, but um, for immigrants that come in, they were the source of inspiration for me. And so that led to the creation, um, me having 
children and inspiring us, and I know I'm talking a little too much, but inspiring me to think, well, how do I teach my kids Somali? We're in, in an environment where they're away from home eight hours of the day. Their teachers are speaking English, entertainment is in English. How do I teach them Somali? And I can honestly say my kids are struggling with Somali. But we started um, thinking about a Somali heritage language program, and um, we do different types of, I do different types of story times for communities, but the one thing that has stuck with me is when you provide space for students to learn, when you provide space for students to, when you're able to see them for who they are and who they want to be, they'll show you what equity looks like and the future leaders that they can be. Um, one of those is a young girl whose parents came up to me and they were like, well, Decca. Um, and I do story times at libraries and they were like, well, Decca, you need to um, change a new song. And I was like, why? I like that song that I'm using. So it's a song called Coco, what? Love a leave and take the salad. And they're like, this girl sings it every day. <laughs> we are tired of it. And so um, I took it with a great assault and I was like, no, I'm not going to change it. I want her to keep annoying you. But like, that is. <laughs> What student-centered work looks like. I see all the students that are here. You inspire us to be who we are. And thank you for coming today. Can, can we just have all the, the students, all the learners that are here, just stand up for a second? Give them a round of applause. For some of us with a little more gray, gray in their beards and their hair, um, I think they're the reason that we're still doing this uh, over these many years. Um, again, my name is Corey Steiner. I'm the proud superintendent of the Northern Cass School District. We're about 25 miles northwest of Fargo. Uh, if you came to our school, you see we're located literally in the middle of cornfields. Uh, we have no communities around us, but we're filled with community. We're a personalized competency-based learning district, and we've been recognized as one of the most innovative public school districts in the country. So student learned learner equity. It's about recognizing the unique gifts, talents, and abilities of the learners we serve. It's the understanding that we as educators in this room must make a conscious decision to create a system that's truly, truly learner-centered. It's why events like today are critical if we are going to set forth a new path for education in this country. It's filled with people, the room is filled with people who have made it their moral imperative to create a new system of learning. But I'm gonna tell you, we have to start standing up to those who are embracing the status quo. We have to tell them no more. We have to look at the current system and say, you are not welcome in our schools anymore. We have to look at the system and say, you're not going to dictate our kids of color, income, or location. No more. That can't be allowed. We must give learners the opportunity to change the world. Like, isn't that a novel idea? The belief must shape the work that allows our learners to change the world simply by letting them be the remarkable human beings they already are. See, we promoted a false narrative in this country. We have told people that changing the world is what gets the most clicks on social media, it's what's on the news, it's what makes headlines. But actually, changing the world happens in our schools in small moments every single second of every single day of every single year. It is that learner who holds the door in the morning and says good morning. They have changed your world and others around you. It is the learner who sees the new kid sitting at the table with no friends, who is experiencing massive isolation, and they walk over and sit beside them, and now they have helped them belong. It is the learner who cheers for their peer when the first time they were ever willing to read in front of others. See, the mistake we make is we think that there has to be this visible change, but it doesn't. It simply has to be the fact that we recognize and celebrate the small moments of change. And I'm going to challenge you today to confront a reality. Listen, I love education, I love educators, and I love learners. We're failing our kids. And we are failing our communities, and right now we are failing this country. 
we should have a country that is built on kindness, compassion, and empathy. And I mean no offense to any of the adults. We're not the ones that are going to be responsible to do that. We must create learner-centered systems to allow our learners to lead from where they are, and that is to lead from our schools. So here, here's why I do it. I do it for my daughters. I do it for my nephews and nieces. But more importantly, I do it for my nephew, Caden, who committed suicide two years ago because nobody had told him he mattered. Nobody had told him he was changing the world just by being him. And I wonder if we can commit to start to tell the stories of Caden, to start to give voices of the kids who have been marginalized, and to start to allow learners to change the world just one simple moment at a time. Thank you. Buenos dias. Um, well, when Alex first reached out, she, she made it sound really easy. You just have to right, answer these two prompts, and here I am. Um, <clears throat> but when, I, when she asked me to reflect on what is students and their learning for equity, I, I had to really sit with it and think about what was I hoping um, would happen when I was in the classroom with some amazing youth. And so um, there's some, some pictures of them up here, but really for me, students center learning for equity is fostering a classroom ecology where our youth can shine, where they can tell their stories, and most importantly, where they can lead. They have so much to teach us if we can only pause and listen. And storytelling is one way that we found our voice within our classroom. Um, our students do a lot of writing through, through the year, and then at the end of the year, uh, we try to make a collection of all these stories and all the work that we have done. And through this process, they really shine. Um, one of the things that I loved the most was when they would get the book at the end that they, take, they get to take home. Um, and, and to have students think, well, that is my artwork. I'm a writer. I'm an illustrator. Um, and, and they really take the lead in doing some of those pieces. So why? Why is the why? Um, Oftentimes I get asked what is my favorite thing about teaching, and graduation day by far is one of the, my favorite days. Um, you don't get to see the hard work, right, that happened between all of these smiley faces. And, and sometimes it's, it's a tricky journey. Sometimes it's not a straightforward journey to get there. But the belief in student center learning for equity shapes our work, which supports these learners. So they can change the world by following their dreams and giving back. Each of them have as varied interests as there are individuals, but they come together to serve their communities with their talents. These are our future entrepreneurs, our future leaders, our future nonprofit um, right, boards of directors, our future workers, it's the future of our country. Um, not only do they go on and, and find their, their way around the world, but every once in a while they email back and they say, Ms. Benjamin, I want to mentor kids like me. I want to give back. I want to teach them some of the lessons that I learned through my journey so that they don't have to struggle to figure it out. Um, and to me, that's the power in giving, them, in giving them voice and experiences in the classroom where they can lead, because tomorrow they will lead us. Thank you. Well, hotep, everyone. Uh, there's a South African greeting, Sawabono, which means I see you. I want to speak to the young folks, because today's topic is about seeing learners, but it is critical that young folks examine how you see yourselves. Schooling and education in this country and beyond is created around a specific narrative and often our young folks are pathologized you're the problem you can't you're at risk and the list goes on and on and on and on I encourage our young folks to reject any message that is disconnected from the creator you each and every one of you are a direct reflection of the creator. 
There is nothing missing and there is nothing broken. How you see yourself will determine who you be in school, in community, and in life. We've recently, uh, my organization has had an opportunity to spend time working in a Twin Cities middle school with seventh and eighth graders. The school told us a particular story about our babies. They said they're in seventh and eighth grade reading at second and third grade levels. Untrue. They said our young folks are at school but not in class. True. They said that some of them are disengaged from learning. Somewhat true, somewhat untrue. So there's many, many stories. When we began to work with our young folks, first thing we did is we did a series of reading assessments. And we found that all 21 of our babies, seventh and eighth graders, I'm sorry for calling y'all babies, but an old man like me get to call you a baby. <laughs> all 21 reading at grade level and beyond. The structures that were in place had a particular narrative, a particular lens through which they were seeing the children that was based in what you can't do, your shortcomings. In nine weeks, we've created the conditions and the space for the young folks to begin seeing themselves and all of their literacy skills. Literacy is more, so much more than just the reading and writing. It's reading, writing, speaking, listening, it's viewing, it's thinking, and it's applying. Our young folks in nine weeks have engaged in their own learning. At the end of the day, we're talking about self-determination, to name ourselves, to see ourselves, define for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. Dr. Asa G. Hilliard, a very important researcher, he said it's important for our young folks to do their academic and cultural homework. So subo bono, message to our young folks, Think critically about how you see yourselves. Our systems are always changing. And they, our systems may not change enough to value and see who you really are. Don't wait for the system to change. We have to change our minds. And we have to speak truth and speak life over ourselves. So will Bono. Thank you, Ms. Jackie and Ms. Alex, for setting the tone and welcoming everyone into the day. And thank you to the SEL 4E advisors, Ms. Sarah White, Ms. Deca Muhidin, Senora Natalia Benjamin, Dr. Corey Steiner, and Elder Giovanni Ford for giving us a little taste impact leaders can have on youth when they are seen. Now that we heard from the STL4E Advisory Council, we want to hear from you. And here's how. Please join me in welcoming to the stage fellow hosts Dorian, Shamara, and Jaquela. Hello, everyone. My name is Dorian, and I'm a senior at Patrick Henry. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shamira Melton, and I go to Patrick Henry High School, now named Camden High. Yes. <laughs> yes, finally. And I plan to attend Augsburg, majoring in political science and education. Hello, I'm Jaquela. I'm a senior at Patrick Henry High School, and also we do not want you to forget our virtual host, Donietta. Donietta, wave hello. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, throughout the day, you'll see uh, us, like you can just see a beige shirt and you can see a pink microphone. We want you to come to us and get interviewed. We have a lot of questions. Your stories matter. So come to us, come find us, or we will find you. <laughs> so there you go. In 2023, SCL4E focused on celebrating the strengths of our communities across generations. We sought to recognize that everyone has something valuable to contribute, whether you're young, old, or somewhere in between. Following last year's conference, we invited three schools, Sage Academy in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, Lakota Tech High School in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and Spring Grove School in rural Southeast Minnesota to take part in a community-centered process to find better solution for school problems. This spring, these schools organized community gatherings where people of all ages came together to share their perspectives. And to make sure the whole thing was captured, the film crew from Youth Lens 360 was there to document it all. Let's take a look at this short video highlighting all three gatherings. So I feel like that's a really big part is to feel community and feel safe with someone or some people that you like or that you can feel like you can talk to and don't have you know judgment in the conversation. I think that's a really big part of it. Communication and community is a really big part of being happy. We're humans, we're social. This spring, students and educators from three schools across the region facilitated intergenerational problem solving events in their communities. They drew on the perspectives and experiences of community members from all generations to tackle the issues that matter to them. Student-centered learning for equity requires a broad school community that sees and values its learners and empowers them as leaders. What we're working on is a town hall to involve the community more with the younger, the middle, and the older generation. I want them to think about the questions of today and the statements that the youth the middle generation and the older generation state. I want them to remember that other people are going through it with you. We put together this community event so that we could get the opinions of our community members and kind of collaborate with them to try and get a student's perspective and a teacher's perspective and a community member's perspective to try and put them all together and see you know, what positive outcomes we can have. This event is gonna be a powerful event, not only for our school, but for the community once again. The young adults and the elders are finally gonna get their voices heard out there. How are the children in our community and how are the elders? And so just questions like that to spark some conversations. Because I think it's important that we hear all kinds of points of views. They're reaching and they're trying to understand. Yeah, but it's giving more power back to the people. The speakers that we have left, they're, they're not used enough. Go to the out, take a deep breath, turn to your left and turn to your right. And say, I love you to that person. So we have to be there for them and be people that they can come and talk to. And we just have to be more open for the kids or like just be there for them. So I guess just like trying to normalize having conversations like that. We are all part of a community. What happens to one child affects everybody. So we can't say that's not our problem. Once a kid feels like they're in control and they understand the context of that control, that's gonna expand and that is safety. As educators, to be aware of warning signs, we communicate with parents. That's the most important thing, awareness. And awareness is a byproduct of education. So it will start with that as well, uh, to implement it in the schools, you know, certain signs and symptoms to look for. For a child, your work is school. So when you come here, all these wonderful individuals are here to help you grow in that we all have to remember that. Bullying people is not cool. I feel like parents sh should also like communicate with your kid and when you communicate with your kid 
you earn their trust and that is why so many kids end up dead because their parents won't listen to them their parents won't believe them and when they say something about it they're gonna overreact that's not what we need we just need someone an outlet to talk to and someone who will listen to us I was able to see an adult's perspective and how they actually viewed these questions that we came up with. I feel like I'm on the same page with the adults that were here. It's really great to see all of us learning from each other. We may have come in thinking one thing, and I, at least myself, I agree with Taylor that I leave thinking another thing. I really appreciated this event, and I appreciated your vulnerability and your willingness to communicate about all of these different things. Use the skills that you have and go out into the community as a student. So I would say that I definitely am concerned about keeping teachers around because students don't treat them right, then they're not going to stick around. Having teachers that are really, really good at what they do, they are going to eventually realize that and look for a job at a bigger school that's maybe going to pay them better or give them better opportunities. You still have to treat them with respect and treat them with kindness. I agree with the, the kids that showing up, right? That's something that the community needs to do for them is showing up. And I feel like we do have a lack of that in certain aspects. So having quality um, mental health supports is something we talked about. So within the school, but also school-based therapy um, is something that students would like to have. When you get to your upperclassmen, your seniors, juniors, and so on, you start realizing what your parents have done for you and you respect them more for what they've gone through to help you out as a student. We are grateful to the schools for letting us film their events, showing us examples of what authentic intergenerational engagement can look like. This is what it looks like to walk the walk. And later during lunch, we hear from some of the people who made it happen. Minnesota's own. Angela Davis of NPR will be talking with adults and students from all three schools about the impact this process has had on their schools and communities. Before we transition, transition to our morning, morning plenary and move into our first round of breakouts, I'd like to invite my fellow host, Jaquela, here to the stage and lead us into activity to set our intentions for today. So we are a little behind on agenda, but thank you, Anna and Jeremy. What is an intention? It is a commitment to oneself that's tied to a purpose. It's about consciously focusing your energy and attention toward your ideal outcome. I invite you all to take out a very special small blue cloud-shaped piece of paper. And if you're here in person, you should have got this at registration. And if you're joining us virtually, then this should have got mailed out to you in your care package. Now, we invite you to take a couple minutes to reflect on what you just watched in the video. Think about your hopes for the day. Set attention for yourself today. What do you hope to get out of our time today? Once you have it, write it down on one side of your cloud. When you're finished, tuck your paper away for now Keep track of it. We have a very special activity at the end of the day using these papers. If you are willing, share your intention using a QR code that will be prompted up shortly on a slide. We love to hear what you hope to get from our time together today. And remember, hold on to your piece of paper. You'll need it later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jacoba. We've got our first round of breakout sessions starting in about five to 10 minutes, but first, a few moments of passing time. For our virtual community, this is the time to stretch your legs, grab a beverage, or take a moment to explore the contents of your care package sent via mail. For our in-person audience, this is the perfect time to introduce yourself to someone new, map out your morning workshop selections, or beat the restroom rush. Don't worry, we have team members ready to help you find where you need to be. 
See you at 11.30 a.m. for a great lunch plenary, which includes a keynote by the incredible author Jesse Taking a Live Reencounter and the panel moderated by NPR's Angela Davis. Enjoy the morning workshops. Once again, welcome to the Student Center Learning from Equity 2024, seeing learners building leaders.